That was incredible footage, Dirk, uh, especially of that uh, elephant seal. Well, this is not the elephant seal saver I'm going to talk about, it's the orca saver. And uh, I will follow up from where I left uh, yesterday. I'm going to go into details on, or based on our experience going through the last 11, 12 years. We've been through a lot of ups and downs, but it certainly has been a learning process getting to where we are today. So I'll be talking about the new Orca Saver device mostly and our expectations launch and also another device called the Soundbeam. And I, at the end I want to mention uh, Mustard Autoline and some improvements that we're also working on there. So Mustad Autoline and SaveWave engineers working together with underwater electronic specialists have dedicated years, as mentioned, and invested enormous resources. Uh, at this point, we finally believe that we're, we're onto something and we, we hope we have solved this challenge. Uh, you might call us very opportunist, opportunistic, but uh, uh, at least uh, we believe that we will see an uh, improvement and uh, hopefully a solution. With the new technology, uh, we uh, generate mixed signals in an analog manner. You might remember yesterday I, I mentioned we've been digital until now. With a broad frequency bandwidth at high decibel levels. The orca saver has been de developed to irritate and confuse the orcas with high output and unpredictable sound signals. This was highly effective for a certain period of time when we first launched the device. But as mentioned, over time, we feel certain we experienced habituation. Due to the fact that the signals on the old version had to be pre-programmed, and, and this was only possible within a limited frequency range of between 5 and 8 kilohertz, in a digital way, we had limited options or opportunities of fighting back. We know that every case of the, uh, excuse my English, depredation uh, is different, and that different pods of killer whales react differently in different situations, in different, uh, two different signals. So different for us has been a key word during this development. The main advantage of the new Orca Saver is its potential to play an unlimited range of signals as long as these signals do not exceed the frequency range of between 10 and 30 kilohertz. And I'll get back to why uh, we've, we've chosen this range. So it will be uh, nearly an unlimited freedom in programming and or modifying the signals. The signals can easily be stored on uh, SD cards that you might be familiar with uh, and uh, played through a Tascam device connected to the Orca Saber. With arbitrary waveform generators, four signals are now or can now be mixed into one analog signal and be admit, emitted by transducers underwater. Natural recordings from killer whales can be distorted and played from the SD memory card. The newly designed signals have been produced by technicians and professors from the Dutch Technologi Technology uh, University in Delft in, in the Netherlands and supervised by our marine biologist. So now, with this device, we believe that by mixing both natural sounds and what we call unnatural or synthetic sounds, um, we can use these, uh, be selective, multiply, filter them, modify, and, and take a new approach towards the killer whale's senses. 
So the basic uh, principles are intimidation, blocking of the communication frequencies, and creating uncomfortable, disorienting, and confusing sound signals. We, uh, this is an audiogram, uh, and I, we use these audiograms um, off of marine mammals or orcas in this case to find the best range of frequencies. Uh, for killer whales, from the sources we have, this is at about 20 kilohertz. And from my understanding, uh, human beings, we are between 4 and 5 kilohertz, meaning we all have a frequency where we hear the best. And when it goes above or below a certain frequency, we can still hear, but not as good. So the orcas from all of our sources have a frequency level between zero and a hundred kilohertz, but their optimal frequency is around 20 kilohertz. So this is the old audiogram showing the frequencies used then, and the new audiogram showing that we will be using frequencies between 10 and 30 kilohertz with no limitations. I'm not sure if I could play this here, but this is just an example of some of the sounds that we can easily create of mixing between the frequency levels. This is uh, probably not as annoying as last time I heard it when the decibel level was a bit higher. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's signals now that we also can't hear because the decibel levels being as low as they are. Okay, so the new system, I just want to underline, we changed out from digital to analog system and emitted a wider frequency spectrum and signals can be varied with no limitation. We know that the Navy uh, have used sonars and frequencies, uh, uh, unlimited range frequencies, and they go a lot lower than... Uh, what we look at as, um, or, or we don't go as low as they do because we know uh, that it damages the whales. They use frequencies down to 3.5 kilohertz and they use decibel levels exceeding 235 decibels. And that's why, where we've heard of, you know, the, is it, you call it strandings? Yeah, strandings where mammals have gone up on shore. So it is a balance act, finding the right frequency, finding the right decibel level without hurting the mammals, and at the same time making it work. So if we get into the different signals that we have uh, strong beliefs in at this point, we separate them into two different main groups. First of all, the natural group, and secondly, unnatural or synthetic uh, signals, as we also call them. The natural group um, today, as we've programmed it, consists of natural sounds from the ocean. Uh, and we have now already pre-programmed an SD card using killer whale sounds and I'll get back to why on the pilot uh, and pilot whale sounds. The reason why we've chosen killer whale sounds at this point is we have noticed based on feedback from fishermen and also uh, marine biologists from sail waves seeing this themselves that between the different killer whale ponds uh, especially oceanic and uh, the residential ponds that a large pond of residentials will almost always scare off a smaller pond of oceanic uh, killer whales. So the signals that we've emitted or are using at this point is identical to the sounds that are coming from a large pond of residential killer whales recorded. 
The second one that we've uh, also used are from pilot whales, and that's the same reason. We've uh, got feedback from several uh, fishing vessels, and we've also seen it ourselves, that when a large pond of uh, pilot whales um, have been between the vessel and the killer whales, the killer whales will keep their distance until that uh, pilot whale pond has um, moved or gone away. So we chose these two, and um, uh, what I can say more is uh, that the natural sounds, let me see here, will be used uh, in two different uh, manners to scare away the killer whales and to disrupt their echolocation and internal communication. Uh, and we believe this will uh, reduce their uh, depredation success. So, um, based on at least what we know at this point, we see that residents and uh, oceanics are the main concern today. Well, the transients, uh, we don't know as much about, but we believe that that's uh, not the ones feeding or eating uh, most of the fish on, on the lines. So, uh, I'll jump over to the unnatural signals, and these are signals that are have either been adapted from natural signals or been customized. We've made some ourselves, um, and this has been together with uh, uh, professors in the Netherlands and uh, uh, choosing these signals. I would say it would surprise me if, we've, if we found the right ones right off the bat, but the main point here is we can keep changing, keep updating these uh, if necessary. Um, we separate these unnatural signals into a communication block. Communication block signals are specially designed to interrupt the killer whale's natural communication um, in, in three different ways. Killer whales use different signals, uh, as we know, I'm not sure if I'm using the right terms, but clicks, whistles, and pulses, like uh, screaming uh, pulses. And clicks are used to uh, echolocate and find their way. Whistles and pulses uh, are used for individual communication, as, as far as we know. And disrupting one or more of these communications would reduce the killer whale's rate at um, the, or the predation rate, we believe. And uh, the other unnatural signal we have are uncomfortable signals, uh, especially designed to cause discomfort and confusion. Um, I want to underline that our transducers now can, they can, uh, play four singles at the same time. We are not sure, maybe we will play all four at the same time, maybe it's enough with one uh, sound of a large residential pond of killer whales. We don't know, but uh, that's what our uh, trials will show us. Um, we also have implemented what we call a ramp up uh, function on this, meaning if uh, mammals or killer whales or uh, any animal should be in the area, you could switch on the device where it ramps up gradually from zero decibel up to uh, the maximum, which is uh, 198 decibels, using a, a, a total of uh, a minute to get up there. So this leaves them some room to get uh, their distance. And remember, 190 decibel is only one meter from the actual ORCA device. Um, let me see if this works. Here you see the Tascam device. And 
and this is just uh, one of the signals that uh, it's four signals overlapping each other there but to show you how easy it is to use this device now and uh, we believe that down the road there might be cases where fishermen in Alaska use the device uh, completely different with different signals than what we will see down here and the and down here, we might see different signals on uh, uh, only 10 miles, 20, 30 miles apart. We know that the, the fishermen themselves are, uh, it's very different based on their ex experience or how many years they've been out there, but they, some of them have become quite, um, I would use the word, experts to recognize the, the ponds and the different whales. And we hope that this will be uh, an advantage for them when choosing the different signal options that they, they can. This is the device. Um, a lot of you have already seen it. It's got 24 transducers uh, pointing in uh, all different directions. Uh, the purpose of this is uh, you lower it uh, about 30 feet below the surface. This is to assure that it's uh, deeper than the, the bottom part of the vessel and you point the right hand side of it towards the, the ground line when, uh, when hauling. This is just a, a quick uh, video showing uh, the deployment. I believe this was in Chile. Yeah. At, yeah. And we, we realized that the deployment, it, it's very different from vessel to vessel, what kind of cranes they have on board, and that this has been a challenge that we know we can improve. But most important is finding out if the technology works or not. This is something we could always improve down the road, but at this point, let's see if this works. One of the reasons why we experienced also different feedback in the beginning when we launched this product, we realized that our, uh, we almost had to be present to make sure that this was operated correctly. So we, we upgraded our, our manuals and made sure that, uh, or tried to eliminate the, the risk of mistakes. Uh, we, worst case scenario, we saw uh, boats putting it 180 degrees pointing the wrong direction, you know, and then they said it was not working. So we want to make sure that, especially during these sea trials, that we collect data in the right way, but that we also have uh, the right people from our company, marine biologists and, uh, and engineers on the vessel to assure uh, that it's not uh, not other, uh, you could say, uh, errors involved than, uh, than the, the technical, if any. In addition to the Orca Saver, we have made a product that we call the Sound Beam. And the technology of this is very similar to the Orca Saver technology, except here we're using one large transducer that will concentrate the signal in the direction where it's pointed. This means some of the vessels and some of the feedback we have received. Oh, oh it's... Uh, okay. Yeah, that was it. No worries. It, it means, based on some of the information and feedback we have received throughout the years from the fishermen, they asked us as well to consider making a product like this. A lot of them would say, if they could concentrate the sound signal on which they use the alpha of the, the orcas and get that uh, one to want to disappear, the rest of the pond will follow. I am not uh, sure about this, but we feel it's, it's worth a try to combine the two if the Orca Saver alone does not do the job. 
Um, we tested this in Alaska last year on uh, a vessel called the Cape Reliant out of Petersburg. And uh, Josh Dunham, the guy that tried it out, he, uh, together with us, installed it uh, so it could easily be steered from the wheelhouse. So the captain actually would uh, maneuver uh, the vessel while hauling the line and would actually steer this device and point it at uh, the whale. Um, this test was done uh, with the sound beam alone, and we did experience it working. Uh, Josh was saying uh, it had to be at 165 degree angle. That was when he saw an effect of it. But we also saw, after using it a couple of days, that uh, it was mixed results based on the whales you have not tested it yet with the Orca Saver. The first Orca Saver, when it comes to our launch and expectations, many would say we're very ambitious or optimistic, but uh, the prototype, the first one, was uh, produced in early 2015 and went to Chile. Due to several reasons, it could not uh, be tested at that moment, but we at least got to test the technical performance of the device and it was flawless. Um, new products since then have been produced. We expect to ship one to Alaska. It's either being shipped this week or next week to Seattle first. Our planned schedule is to test two of these Orca devices together with a sound beam in Alaska the coming months. We uh, hope to see one down in the south somewhere, uh, not determined yet where this will be. And then uh, another prototype uh, with 230 volt vessel. Um, so our expectations in regards to commercial sale, if we get to uh, the sea trials done and uh, get the results we're, we're hoping for, uh, we expect positive feedback, but then the commercial phase will start later this year, uh, third or fourth quarter of 2016. These are very high-tech devices, and we have limited capacity when it comes to production. Uh, so if uh, or when, the optimistic guy in me, uh, when these turn out to work, we can only produce eight uh, as a maximum this fall, and they will only be produced upon order. At the end of my presentation here, I want to mention Mustad Autoline and uh, our, our systems. You know, it's important for us uh, to, as mentioned yesterday, we use 10% of our turnover goes directly back into R&D. A lot of this has gone towards the Orca Saver over the last years, but we constantly work on our own components as, as well. And if you look at the last 20, 25 years and some of the improvements that have been made, these are directly related to what we know today works as um, to avoid uh, increasing depredation. Hauling speed, it's been improved dramatically. We um, have uh, small things like l raising one of our components called the hook separator and changing the angle on this has allowed an increase of the hauling speed uh, with uh, less uh, labor intensive operations. And just the baiting process alone, um, having our super baiter on board with 97% bait up, it makes a huge difference in the catch per uh, the CP, what do you call it, CPUA ease. It makes a difference there. And I, I just want you to take that in consideration on some of the data that you're collecting out there because uh, the gear, choice of hook, choice of line, Hauling speed, and by hauling speed, I mean not the duration of the haul. Because you're hauling the buoy line, you might have stops that happen during, but the actual speed of the hauler. We should take that in consideration, because with no depredation out there, there are vessels catching uh, more fish than others by um, 
using different gear. I want to mention in Alaska in the 80s, they uh, started using the circle hook and most fishermen up there were skeptical. They said, no way, 90 degree point pointing towards the shank. This cannot work. We have to use the J-hook. I'm not saying that's the case with the tooth fishery, but in Alaska, one boat started, the next one followed. We didn't even sell it in. It was just word of mouth. And today we know that the CPUE has went up dramatically in the late 80s in Alaska just by changing the hook. So thank you for your... Or oh, wait, one last thing. Line controller as well. I'm Knowing the tension of your line when hauling is also something we want to underline from Mustad. Because we know losing a lot of gear is caused by not knowing the tension of the line. And to uh, minimize depredation, we maximize hauling speed. And to assure uh, not loss of too much gear or any gear, uh, we, we recommend any boat. And it's not just Mustad selling this, it's uh, available. But knowing the tension of your line is key to increase hauling speed. Yes, thank you for your attention.